Hi there. You are listening to the Perio Patient Podcast, a podcast for my patients and anyone else who cares to listen. My name is Dr. Ben Young, and I am a periodontist treating patients in my own private practice here in San Antonio, Texas. The title of this podcast, number 68, is about dental implants. Welcome if this is your first time listening. Recently, a patient came to me, referred by an excellent comprehensive dentist friend, to evaluate a problem with a loose crown abutment over a dental implant. So let me back up a dental implant. What I mean by that is the part that goes into the bone and the part that you chew on is the crown and the part that holds the crown to the implant we call the abutment. And sometimes those things are glued together or made together, the crown abutment. So that's what I've called it. The implant was placed seven to eight years ago by another dentist entirely, no longer on the scene. About two years ago or so, the crown, according to the patient, became loose. This crown is the replacement for a lower first molar, and the patient is missing the two molars behind this one. So it is the terminal chewing crown on one side of the mouth. So let's talk about this problem as a way of talking about one of the most interesting and transformative developments within my career as a dentist. When I graduated from dental school many moons ago, dental implants were unpredictable and frankly thought of as experimental and fringe dentistry. They were not taught uh, seriously in undergraduate dental school, whereas today, every dental school in the country, I believe, has some level of experience at least restoring dental implants for the dental students. It's a big change. Something remarkable happened after my graduation in the mid 1980s. A new dental implant system came along with new surgical methods of placement and it fundamentally transformed dental implants for everyone. Before this discovery of how the body can integrate or grow to accept the implant and the material of the implant, the most common one is titanium. There are a few others we're not going to get into here. We call this growth of bone to the implant osseo, meaning bone, osseous. And in other forms, it's called osteo, but we're dentists, so we do it our own way osseo integration, the integration of the implant with bone growing straight to it. Also at that time, before this, we didn't know that if you heated the bone up when preparing the site to place the implant, that there would be bone cell death and we would not recover from this and the implant would be lost. So there were techniques involved that enable us to place an implant, prepare for that, and keep all of the bone cells healthy by the method of irrigating and how we created the, the space for the implant. That was also new at that time. Also, the type of implant being a screw type implant as opposed to other methods that were done before this was found to be a very simple way to place an implant that was safe and gave us the surface areas necessary to overcome the chewing requirements that would be needed so that people would be able to chew with these implants. Prior to this, the success rate of implants was less than five years. After this, we believe that dental implants have the longest ability to last in the mouth compared to every other dental restoration that we can place. They have a longer life 
than crowns and bridges and other filling materials. Anything else, the dental implant, that part that goes into the bone, has a longer life. And uh, a lot of them are going way beyond 30 years now. So, the, but well, I've got this problem with this patient who's come in with the loose crown abutment. We're going to talk about that because it's not 100% and we need to make sure that you understand what's necessary once you have an implant, that it isn't perfect and it won't last forever if nothing else is ever done. The other thing I'm gonna say is that the engineering of the dental implant is designed so that hopefully if something were to fail, it's a part that we can replace. So the crown abutment, this little bitty screw that tightens that crown abutment onto the implant part that's in the bone. Those things can weaken and fail and be replaceable. The crowns, if they have porcelain, they can chip, they can fade. All of the things that are possible with other crowns in people's mouths, with the exception of you won't have a pulp, so you won't have that kind of tooth pain ever again with an implant, and it won't decay because the, there isn't a bacteria that's capable of dissolving titanium or some of these other, these other materials. Again, after these new techniques and dental implants became commercially available, this was around the mid 1980s, the success rate for dental implants shot up and became so good that now the dental implant is considered the most successful and predictable dental restoration available its survival rate is better than crowns, bridges, and fillings of all kinds. Having said all of this, dental implant systems can run into problems for three basic reasons. And you, if you have dental implants or may need their service in the future, need to know about them. So the first one has to do with the bone implant connection. And the second one, has to do with chewing and biting forces against the implant. And the third one has to do with the same potential chronic infections that affect the teeth. Instead of periodontitis, we call a similar process affecting the dental implant as peri-implantitis. So let's talk about each potential problem. If a dental implant has problems, say, within the first six months or so, it is likely due to a bone implant connection failure. Adequate osseointegration was not achieved. The body's bone cells did not grow and essentially stick to the specially designed implant surface, at least in enough quantity to cause that implant to become what they normally become, and that is 10 times stronger or more capable of handling loads compared with natural teeth. These problems can be significantly reduced by not pushing the healing envelope after the implant is surgically placed. In other words, sometimes it is acceptable, even smart, to extract a tooth and place an implant immediately, but at other times, it is better to stage things so the implant rests within the bone and heals before its top is exposed and the parts, uh, the crown and abutment, are then placed that puts this implant into chewing service. After the implant has healed past six months and there are no signs of problems, it is likely that osseointegration has been achieved. Now, the greater concern has to do with loading. To explain the difference between how dental implants take forces and how teeth take forces, let's review the four parts of the tooth. We have enamel, dentin, pulp, and the least known but most important when it comes to periodontal disease, that cementum. And the cementum holds or cements little bitty fibers that project from it, and we call those periodontal fibers. These act as sort of the shock absorber 
of the tooth. When a tooth is overloaded, it compresses these fibers, which does two things. First, it allows the tooth to move and in moving, absorb some of the force of the load. Teeth can get loose and then tighten up again, thanks to the activities going on with the periodontal fibers, also called ligaments. The principle of moving teeth with orthodontics involves this process as well. In other words, teeth can be moved through bone, very different than a dental implant. The second way these fibers help when teeth are overloaded is due to the nerves placed within this fiber network that fire and send a message to the brain with not only pain information like, oh man, that's sore, but also the location of the problem. It's sore and it's right here. This spot bothers me. This ability to tell the brain locations of where the different parts of the body are relative to one another is called proprioception. This is what gives you the ability to touch the first fingers of your two hands together while your eyes are closed. Proprioception allows you to eat food and not bite your tongue and cheek at the same time. Meaning that whenever you bite your tongue and cheek, it's always a surprise and it doesn't happen that often, thanks to proprioception. But what about the dental implant? First, as we've said, they don't have a fiber system surrounding them. Bone fuses to the implant. This means that they do not have the same proprioceptive ability. Because they osseointegrate directly to bone, they resist forces better than teeth can. However, if the forces become excessive and the brain is not aware of this, then eventually there can be microfracture of the implant bone interface. If this happens, then the implant will become loose and eventually fall out. And my experience is we don't watch these when they become loose. We're just waiting and then we'll take them out later. So a loose body implant, implant the part that's in the bone, if it becomes loose, the best thing to do is to remove it. Another possibility with excessive forces is fatigue of the metal, which then results in a fracture of the implant. It breaks. Unfortunately, this is what happened with the case I described at the beginning. That loose crown abutment over two years fatigued the metal of the implant itself and it fractured out. We were only able to see this once the crown abutment had been removed, which required drilling a hole through the crown to get to the little set screw, unscrew it, and then we could see what we were dealing with. Now, sometimes it isn't that bad, but in his particular case, that was the problem, which then resulted in us having to extract or remove the implant. And now we're in the process of waiting for the grafted area to heal once again, and then reassess to see how we can place a new implant into that area. But again, it's going to take some time for healing. And we go back through the same process. Now it is good news that we can still, we have a back door, we haven't failed the ability to use implants, but it's unfortunate that that's what happened. So that was the second one of the problems that can develop. Let's go back over the first and second. The first one is a failure within the first six months of placement, which then kind of leans towards the surgical placement and maybe the failure of osseointegration to have occurred in the beginning. And then we're worried about the loading forces on the implant system. And again, the third are the chronic diseases that have affected teeth can affect the implant. We call it peri-implantitis. And the treatment for that is very similar to treatments for infections in the gums around teeth. Clean the areas, manage them uh, just in, in similar ways. 
So let's go back and think about this case. What might have given it a better outcome? First, it's critical that dental implants be checked annually. You can't have an implant system and not be seen for a number of years. Problems will develop. Every year, it is a good idea to take a dental x-ray of an implant to make sure that the bone levels are still good around it and that there is no evidence that something has become loose, a crown is loose or something else. Again, the individual's ability to identify problems through proprioception don't work as well as they do with teeth. So you just have to go in and have it checked. The second step is to check bite forces over dental implant crowns. This is accomplished by biting on a colored marking paper and seeing where the marks are, and also using a thin silver looking mylar strip we call shim stock. And now shim stock's used in other areas of life too, but, but it's a shim stock, ideally initial contact forces when you bite down are between natural teeth first because you have this ability of the periodontal fiber space to contact first and then the little shock absorbers go into effect and once they are pressed enough then the crown over an implant can come into contact so once all the teeth are contacting then the implant crown should contact Shimstock helps to find the contacts where they're hitting and holding. So the dentist will have, have you bite down lightly and tug on the shimstock, and it should slide easily over the crown that's on the implant while connecting with the teeth. That gives us how, an idea of where the first contacts are, and ideally we want them over the teeth and not over the implant. Another way to think of this is to understand that the thickness of the shim stock represents the thickness of the periodontal ligament space. Finally, if something feels loose, do not wait to see if it gets better. It's not going to get better. And if perhaps you are seen soon enough, that implant may still be usable. Also, even if you have only dental implants, you no longer have teeth. You may have escaped tooth decay, but not the chronic infections like periodontal disease. So checkups and cleanings are still important. Well, that's enough to chew on for now. This has been the Perio Patient Podcast. I'm still Dr. Ben Young. Thanks for listening. If you have questions or comments, please send them to me. Have a great day. Bye for now.